Hello, this is Dr. Ross, and in this presentation, I'm going to go over the accessory structures of the integumentary system. So first, let's start with uh, just reviewing the three layers of the skin. So we have three main layers. We have the epidermis. Recall, that's the surface layer. It's composed of really tightly packed cells, and this layer performs or forms a protective coat. Below that is the dermis. Uh, most of the skin is going to be composed of dermis. It's got fewer cells, and this is where we have the location of the accessory structures that I'm going to be discussing today, as well as the blood supply. And then below that is the hypodermis, which is also uh, referred to as the subcutaneous layer, and it's composed mostly of adipose tissue, which is fat. Okay, so... Um, as I mentioned, a lot of these accessory structures are going to be located in the dermis, so I'm just going to go over the dermis as well. Um, so there are um, two major tissue layers uh, within the dermis. You have a superficial papillary layer um, that is composed of loose connective tissue. Uh, it's full of blood vessels uh, that feed the epidermis as well as sensory receptors that gather sensory information. The papillary layer also contains the dermal papilla, uh, which are what this layer is named for. And these structures are going to basically increase the surface area of the papillary layer, and that's going to allow for increased gas exchange um, as well as nutrients and waste products between uh, these two layers. Um, the dermal papilla interlock or papillae interlock with the epidermal ridges, and these strengthen the interaction between these two layers. Now, deep to the papillary layer is the reticular layer. Um, now, this is an interwoven meshwork of dense, irregular connective tissue containing both collagen and elastic fibers. This layer um, houses the accessory structures of the skin, including the hair follicles. Um, <clears throat> uh, it also has the oil and sweat glands, um, as well as larger sensory structures. Now, before we discuss these accessory structures in more detail, I want to go through some general anatomical terms for, for circular organs or circular-ish organs. Um, <clears throat> so in this picture, this circular organ, organ is, is represented by this, um, this, this circle with three layers. So the innermost layer of circular-ish organs is going to be referred to as the medulla. The middle layer will be referred to as the cortex, and the outer layer um, will get different names. Sometimes it will be referred to as the capsule, other times it will have uh, different names altogether, and these can vary from organ to organ. So with that, let's get moving on. Let's start first with hair follicles. Okay, and a donkey. Okay, so <laughs> hair is consisted of two distinct, distinct structures. You have the follicle, which is the living part located under the skin, as well as the hair shaft, which is the fully keratinized, non-living part of the hair that's above the skin surface. So the hair shaft is the part of the hair that's not anchored to the follicle, and it's the part of the hair that you can see. The rest of the hair, which is anchored in the follicle, lies below the surface of the skin, and this is referred to as the root. Now, the hair itself consists of three layers, and this is referring back to that previous slide. You have the cuticle, uh, which is the outermost layer, the cortex, and the medulla. Now, the medulla uh, forms the central core of the hair, and that's going to be surrounded by the cortex, which is going to be a layer of those compressed, keratinized cells. And then the medulla is covered by really hard keratin keratinized cells, and those are going to be referred to as the cuticle. Now, the hair root ends deep in the dermis at the hair bulb, and the hair bulb includes a layer of um, uh, mitotically active cells, so these are cells that are undergoing cell division, um, and that's called the hair, those are located within the hair matrix. The cells within the hair matrix divide and push cells outward in the hair root and shaft as it grows. Now, depending on the location of these daughter cells, they then form the medulla, cortex, and cuticle of the hair. 
As cell divisions continues at the hair matrix, the daughter cells are going to be pushed toward the surface of the skin, and the hair is going to get longer. Now, the keratinization um, process is completed by the time the cells approach the surface. So at the level that corresponds to the start of the hair shaft, the part you can see, the cells in the medulla, cortex, and cuticle are dead, and the ker keratinization process is at an end. Now back down to that matrix area, that surrounds the hair papilla, which is made of connective tissue, and this contains the blood capillaries and nerve endings from the dermis. So this is going to feed those cells within the matrix. Um, now we can also see some of these structures on this micrograph of a hair follicle. In this image you can see the connective tissue root sheath as well as the epithelial tissue root sheath, which make up the hair follicle. Um, and then this image also shows you the matrix located near the bottom, as well as the cortex and the medulla. Now also found associated with hair follicles is what's called a root hair plexus, uh, consisting of um, sensory nerves that surround the base of each hair follicle. And this is going to enable you to feel movement of the shaft of even a single hair. And this sensitivity is thought to provide an early warning system that can help uh, prevent injury. All right, so the other structures associated with the hair follicle include the erector pili muscle. Um, which consists of a small band of smooth muscle that connects the hair follicle to the connective tissue of that basement membrane. Now when this muscle contracts, it causes the hair to stand on end and creates chill bumps or goose pimples, uh, whatever you call it. Um, now in non-human mammals, this mediates thermoregulation um, by increasing air trapping. The erector pili muscle also helps deposit oil on the surface because when that muscle contracts, it interacts with the sebaceous gland that's located here near the hair follicle. Now the sebaceous gland opens into the hair follicle um, and it produces like an oily or waxy substance, which we'll discuss a little bit more further down in this presentation. Now hair has several... Um, um, the hair on your body has several important functions. So the hair on your head is there to protect your scalp uh, from ultraviolet radiation or sunburn. It's also there to help cushion light impacts uh, to the head and insulate the skull. The hair is guarding the entrance to your nostrils and ear canals will filter air and help keep out foreign particles and insects. Uh, your eyelashes will do the same for the surfaces of the eyes. Um, eyebrows will also, um, the hair in your eyebrows is going to be important because it helps keep sweat out of your eyes. Hair also plays a role in thermoregulation. It retains heat in location where the hair is thick, which is pretty much going to be your scalp. It also provides critical roles in sensory reception. So the hair root plexus is a sensory fiber that detects light, touch, or movement of the hairs. Hair also functions in communications. It helps humans identify each other's, each other, and it also helps disperse pheromones from the axillary and pubic regions. All right, the next structure I want to discuss is the nails. So nails protect the exposed surface, the exposed dorsal surfaces of the tips of your fingers and toes. It also helps limit the distortion of your digits from mechanical stresses that they endure. So starting with the image on the right, we can see the nail body, which is the visible portion of the nail. The nail consists of dead, um, tightly compressed cells that are packed with keratin. The cells producing the nails can be affected by conditions that alter body metabolism, so changes that you see to nail shape, structure, or appearance can provide useful diagnostic information. So for example, um, nails may turn yellow in individuals who have um, respiratory disorders, thyroid disorders, or um, AIDS. So the nail body is recessed deep uh, to the level of the surrounding epithelium, and it's bordered on either side by um, nail grooves and lateral nail folds. The distal portion that continues past the nail bed or past the tip of the finger is the free edge of the nail. The characteristic pink color of the nail is due to the underlying blood vessels um, because the nail is thin enough there where you can see uh, that coloring. However, near the root, uh, the vessels can be obscured and that leaves this, this pale crescent shape that we call the lunula. I'm sorry, lunula. <laughs> 
Now, moving to the image on the left, we can see the structures underlying the nail body. Directly below the nail body is the nail bed. Um, this is the skin beneath the nail plate. The distal edge is the hyponychium. Um, it's also nor informally known as the quick of the nail. Um, and basically, this is epithelium located beneath the nail plate at the junction between that free edge and the skin of the fingertip. And it forms a seal that protects the nail bed. The eponychium forms a seal on the proximal end of the nail. This is often referred to as the cuticle. And somewhat below this area is the nail matrix. Um, which contains the nail root. Uh, the nail matrix has uh, proliferating cells from the stratum basale that enables the nail to grow continuously. So the width and thickness of the nail is determined by the size, length, and thickness of the matrix, while the shape of the, finger, um, of the fingertip bone determines if the nail plate is flat, arched, or hooked. So in mammals, interestingly, the growth rate of nails is related to the length of those terminal phalanges, that outermost finger bone. So in humans, the nail of the index finger grows, the fast, it grows, grows faster than that of the little finger, and fingernails grow up to about four times faster than toenails. So moving on, we're going to talk about glands next. So I mentioned these in a previous presentation. Um, the integument includes glands, and these can be categorized by what they secrete and how they secrete. So sweat glands, which are also known as sudoriferous glands, which includes the Latin uh, root sudor, which means sweat. These are small tubular structures of the skin that produce sweat. Uh, sweat glands are a type of exocrine glands, which are um, <clears throat> which produce and secrete substances onto an epithelial surface by way of a duct. And there's two main types um, <clears throat> of sweat glands, and they differ in their structure, function, and secretory project, uh, product. So first, we're going to talk about the eccrine uh, sweat glands. Um, these are also known as marocrine sweat glands. And they are widely distributed all over the human body in varying densities. The highest density is going to be on the palms and soles of your feet, then on the head, and there's going to be much less on the trunk and the extremities. The secretion is a water-based secretion, uh, your sweat, which represents a primary form of cooling. So these are basically going to be coiled tubular glands that discharge, discharge their secretions directly onto the surface of the skin. The sweat from the eccrine sweat gland is 99% water, but it does contain, contain like sodium chloride, um, which gives it its salty taste, and it has a pH range anywhere from 4 to about 6.8, so it's slightly acidic. The fu functions of these sweat glands include um, cooling the surface of the skin to reduce body temperature. Uh, this is the primary function of uh, perspiration. Um, Interestingly, if all of your eccrine sweat glands are working at their maximum, we can perspire more than a gallon per hour. Um, <clears throat> so that could be a dangerous amount of fluid loss um, if, you are, are, um, if you're sweating this much. And so this is why if you're doing endurance sports or working outside in hot conditions, you really need to drink fluids uh, regularly. Um, so they also, like I mentioned, excrete water electrolytes, and they also excrete some drugs. So this is one of the ways we can detox detoxify uh, some metabolized drugs from our system. Um, sweat also provides protection from environmental hazards. It can dilute harmful content, uh, chemicals that contact the skin. Um, it also discourages the growth of microorganisms because, uh, one, it flushes them from the surface, uh, making it difficult for them to adhere. It also produces a uh, dermicidin or dermicidin, which is a small peptide that has antibiotic properties. Um, the other type of sweat gland is apocrine sweat glands. These are pheromonal sweat glands. These are mostly limited to the axillary uh, and perianal areas in humans, and they are not significant for cooling. So the apocrine sweat gland uh, is composed of a coiled secretory portion uh, from which a straight portion inserts and secretes into the hair follicle. So apocrine sweat glands are found in the armpit, the areola, the perineum, 
um, the ear and the eyelids. They secrete, portion, the secretory portion is larger than that of the eccrine glands, and so this makes them a little bit larger overall, even though it's really not evident from this drawing. Now before puberty, apocrine sweat glands are inactive. Um, hormonal changes during puberty cause the glands to increase in size and begin functioning. So apocrine sweat glands are most active in times of stress and sexual excitement. Um, and the substance they secrete is thicker than the other sweat glands, and they provide, uh, and this can provide nutrients for bacteria on the skin. And so it's the bacteria's decomposition of this that creates that, that odor. So also, interestingly, in mammals, apocrine sweat contains pheromone-like compounds to attract other organisms. So this includes humans. Uh, and a study of human sweat has revealed that there's differences between these components in the men and women apocrine secretions, as well as the bacteria that are located near them. So moving on, we also have modified apocrine sweat glands, uh, and this includes your ceremonious glands. Uh, these are found in the external acoustic meatus, the ear canal. It produces that waterproof ceramin, which we call earwax, and that traps foreign particles and lubricates the tympanic membrane. There's also mammary glands. These are modified apocrine glands as well. They're found um, on both in the mammary region of males and females, but they only become fully developed during a female's first pregnancy. And they produce a fatty protein-rich sweat called milk. The final gland I'd like to talk about is the sebaceous glands. Sebaceous glands um, or oil glands are holocrine glands and these just charge an oily lipid secretion called sebum uh, and this protects skin from drying as well as has antibacterial properties. The glands are always attached to a hair follicle. The sebum passes from the gland and enters the lumen of the um, this, I'm sorry, passes through the gland cells, enters the lumen or the passageway of the gland. And then as I mentioned previously, that erector pili muscle um, contracts and squeezes the sebaceous gland, forcing that sebum into the hair follicle and ultimately onto the surface of the skin. When these type of glands become plugged, they cause acne. Uh, and so you shouldn't be surprised to learn that they're most active at puberty, which is when you typically experience your most significant amount of, act uh, of acne. The last thing I'm gonna discuss in this presentation is the sensory structures of the integument. So the integument is filled with nerve fiber endings and sensory receptors. Um, so anything that comes in contact with the skin from the lightest touch um, to something really intense is going to initiate a nerve impulse that can then that can cause us to have conscious awareness. So nerve fibers in the skin um, control blood flow, they adjust gland secretions, they monitor, monitor sensory receptors in the dermis and the deeper layers of the epidermis. Now there are two major types I'm going to discuss here. The first one is tactile or mesmeric corpuscles. Uh, and these are going to provide sensory information about light touch. The other ones, uh, and those are circled here um, in this green circle on the image to the right. There are also lamellar or pacinian um, corpuscles. These are deep pressure sensors. You can see those circled here toward the bottom. They kind of look like lollipops. Uh, and then, as I've already mentioned, you also have the hair root plexus. Uh, these are going to detect movement of the hairs. And that is it for this presentation. Thank you for listening.